my note cards because um, if my slides go out, I could never do what Jeffrey did. Um, <laughs> and plus, I've seen a TED Talk with John Doerr, who's a big investor in clean tech, and I saw that he had note cards. But I'm going to put them down, but they're there for me, just in case. So I want to start um, by telling you a story um, when I was a little girl. I really have always had this profound love of the earth. And I grew up in a small town in Northwest Connecticut in a white house, no picket fence, set back from the road with a big pine tree outside my window, big tall bushes in the back filled with birds and rabbits, a red barn where we kept a burrow named Cheetah. <laughs> and one morning, my mom gathered my sisters and me together to say we were moving. I said, Mom, you know why? We love this house. And she said that the landlord was requiring her to cut down the bushes because they were unsightly. It was Connecticut. And I said, Mom, you know, what's going to happen to the birds and the rabbits? And she was like, um, well, we're, we're not going to cut them down. I, I refuse to do it. We won't cut them down because the birds and rabbits would have no home. So she packed us up, and we moved about four miles out of town up on a mountain uh, that was even more magical, this house. We had fields in the front, um, forest in the back with riding trails, a meandering brook, even a swamp with, filled with pollywogs, which I just love to explore. Um, and every waking moment when I was not in school, I was outside. So a few months later, my mom and I decided to drive by our old house. And we looked at each other in dismay when we saw this manicured lawn that had replaced this wild bush that we loved so much. I said, Mom, you know, what happened to the birds and the rabbits? And she could see that I was upset. And as moms do, she said, don't worry, it's all OK. The birds and the rabbits just moved farther into the woods. My entire life, I have seen us push and push the plants and animals farther into the woods. And with climate change, we have no farther woods. There is no more away from us. And I cannot assure my son that it's going to be all OK. I have to tell him that his mommy is trying everything she can to save our planet, and that we're going to do it, and we're not going to give up. And sometimes I hear us giving up. So as I said, um, I am a banker by training. I learned a lot of things in banking. Um, and I guess you know, I was also trying to share my vision that a healthy economy can only occur when we have a healthy environment. But one of the key takeaways I have from a, the corporate world was that nobody wants to hear problems. They only want to hear solutions. Amy, just tell me how to get it done. So that's what I want to do today, is how are we going to get this done? How are we going to create a healthy and prosperous future for us all, as well as protect the planet? And we can't do that. We can't really come up with the right solutions unless if we actually talk about the problems. We don't seem to want to do that very much, certainly around here in this, in this country. But it's critical for us to understand the enormity and the urgency that we're facing. So as we heard, there's this magical number seven, and that's the seven billion people living on the planet. The population actually doubled since I was a child. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing. The UN statistic right now is that by 2050, we will be at 9.3 billion people on our way to 10. It's crazy. Um, we, with that population, we're becoming increasingly urban. And we heard about that a little bit from one of the previous um, speakers, which is a good thing because cities, we are more efficient, basically. Um, and then it's going to allow us to protect some of the wild places for the birds and the animals. But I think it's a bad thing for our psyche. In 20 years, 75% of the global population will be living in cities, which means that only a quarter of us have any connection to the land to see the change that we are creating, what, to witness what we, what's happening with climate change. And most staggering to me is that China, in 20 years, will build an entire United States of America in terms of homes and commercial buildings. That's an entire United States of America. Another 
trend that's happening is that we are getting wealthier. Even though half the population lives on $2.50 a day, they're able, we're able to lift some folks out of poverty. Particularly, we're seeing that in India and China. China, it's, pred it's predicted that in 10 years, 70% of China's population will be middle class. That's three times the population of the United States. So you've seen these growth charts before. This is just indicative here. We are witnessing growth without parallel in human history. We have demand for water going up, demand for food going up, demand for energy going up, as well as all the associated emissions with that. When we sort of move, house, clothe, feed us, you know, the, the list goes on. If we continue at this pace, we will completely outstrip the Earth's capacity to support us. And we're already seeing that with climate change. It is beginning to wreak havoc on our ecosystem. And with business as usual, we are on track to make the Earth uninhabitable as we know it. Unless we drastically reduce emissions, some say about up to 60% in the next 40 years. Humans are curious and contradictory animals. On one hand, we can create the most beautiful and inspiring art. We saw that earlier with the, the wonderful jazz performance. But we're the only species on the planet that dirties our own nest. And there's no news coming, no good news coming from the climate science community. I have a, a board member that I go, Bill, you know, please, you know, you gotta tell me you've got something wrong, you know, give me some good news. It's like, Amy, I can't. Everything the climate scientists are predicting is coming true, only it's happening faster. So as Bob Dylan says, you better start swimming or you're gonna sink like a stone. This is not the future I want, nor you. So I see that we have three choices. One, we can continue to deny people the lifestyle we enjoy. And that seems to be what we like to do because half of the planet lives on $2.50 a day. Um, I used to always say, and sometimes still do, that rich people don't care about poor people or we would have solved poverty a long time ago. But I don't think it's that we don't care. I think it's that we're in denial. It's just too hard to look poverty in the eye. And by de if we're in denial, then you know, we don't have to care and then we don't have to hurt. The second uh, thing we can do is reduce. Reduce dramatically the population growth rate. Population is a key variable in the climate change equation, whether you want to hear it or not. I don't see this as happening because we struggle to provide women access to health care and education around the globe. I just don't see it happening. So the third thing is that we can innovate. We can fundamentally innovate the way that we produce and consume our energy. We can set in motion a clean revolution that will meet the needs of both a growing and aspiring population. But what we have to do is fundamentally innovate the hell out of everything. That's why this conference is so great, and I loved Sam, you know, bring on the fungi. <laughs> but there is good news. We have the technology today to solve 70% of the emissions reductions needed by 2050. We have that today. And I'm just going to show you three technologies, and these alone are not going to solve the problem. But I picked them because I'm 99% sure all of you have heard of them, some of you have seen them, many of you have touched them, and maybe a few of them even own them or have them. So let's start with the electric vehicle. Right now, we're really driving around in souped up Model T Fords, right, using the 100 year old technology. The internal combustion engine is 75% inefficient. It means that 25% of the energy used from the gasoline to propel the car, that, that's all it is. The rest of it goes out the tailpipe as waste heat or pollution. EVs are a step change in efficiency. You plug them in at night when it's cheaper, and better yet, you plug them in at night when the wind is blowing, when we have renewables. And they're better even with the existing um, fossil fuel grid that we have right now. Last year, some of you might have heard about um, the IPO for Tesla Motors. That was the first 
American car company IPO in over 50 years. And Tesla is amazing to me. This is not a Tesla, by the way. <laughs> um, the first time I saw one um, ever on the road, I was actually driving up the West Side Highway. I live in New York with my husband, and it was nighttime. So we're driving up the highway, and suddenly there's this flash of silver and light just go whoosh, right by us. And we both looked at each other. We knew it was a Tesla. We said, now that is a cool car. Now, it's expensive, but that was the point. Elon Musk um, wanted to develop a fantastic-looking, high-performing sports car that could go from zero to 60 in four seconds, could drive 200 miles on a single charge, and have zero emissions. What a way to wake up a staid and stagnant industry. There are now 30 EV models around the globe. The second uh, technology I want to talk about is lighting. It's not exactly as sexy as um, a sports car, but we've also probably heard that incandescent, the incandescent light bulb right, hasn't changed much since Edison's day. Um, it's really a misnomer, right? The light bulb is actually a heater that produces light as a byproduct. It's 2% efficient. Crazy as it seems, we dig up coal that was created before the dinosaurs to produce electricity to power our lamps. And it's 98% inefficient. So five years ago, LEDs basically were laughed at. And LEDs are little semiconductors that produce light. But they got a huge boost in, in 2008 at the Summer Olympics in Beijing. The Chinese installed LEDs throughout the entire national stadium, which was 20,000 square meters. And, and they've, they've just taken off in that, in that sense, particularly in China. And now there are cities around the world that are rolling out test pilots of outdoor street lights from Sydney to Calcutta. And actually what you see here, this is New York City's Central Park, and that's an LED path light. The light is better. It's cooler. It's crisper. It requires little maintenance. There's no light pollution. And it's, with smart controls, it's up to 70% more efficient. And really importantly for New York City, and particularly for Central Park, is it meets the city's safety requirements. So third technology, which I know you've all heard of, is the sun, solar. Solar's time is now. The sun's potential <laughs> eclipses all other renewable energy potential. And it's a resource that doesn't peak, at least for five billion years. We can power the entire global economy for a year with the amount of sun that hits the Earth in one hour. So we're seeing solar panels going up around the world on factory rooftops, on homes, on telephone poles, in fields, you name it. I was actually um, at a farm in upstate New York recently, and the farmer had a little battery with a solar panel on top, and it was attached to a portable electric fence. And he loved this because he's like, I can take my sheep and put them in the right meadows for grazing without having to go through the toil and the cost of building a permanent fence. But those little applications are not going to do it. We need solar to replace baseload coal. So we need large solar power plants to do that. And we're seeing that. We're beginning to see that already a little bit in California. We've got some of it happening in Spain. And with just 1% of the world's um, desert area, if we fill that with what's called concentrated solar power, we can create enough electricity to power uh, as much as the electricity that we use today. So I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a burden to me. That sounds like incredible opportunity. But what we need to do is we need to demand of our leaders that we get this technology out into the market now. We have to do that. We have to get into the market as rapidly as possible because that's where the innovation is going to occur. That's where you get the competitive forces that are going to drive down the price, drive up the quality. And we heard earlier Gabor talking with the telephone, right? Um, we all know the first cell phone was the size of like an eight-track cassette, and it cost $6,000. But the cell phone, it, it's amazing how quickly that product has improved. The price has come down and the product has improved that 4.6 billion people around the globe now have a cell phone. 
So only with transformative change like that will we save ourselves. Yet we seem to doubt the future can be any different than this. The oil and gas companies and the coal companies are resisting this change because they're afraid it's going to upset their current economic model or the current status quo. They cannot imagine that the world will be better and that they can be part of it. There are only a handful of power companies in the U.S. that are trying to, to create new business models to uh, uh, solve climate change, and they get beaten back for innovating. We cannot just blame them, though. It's us, too. We doubt ourselves. We think it's going to cost more. We think we're going to have to wear a sweater at night, or we're going to have to drive a smaller car. But the technology is better. It's better. Somehow we have it in our heads that if we stop polluting the air, our lives are going to get worse. Somehow we think that by continuing to pollute the planet, we're going to create a better life for our children and grandchildren. It's absolutely insane. No one can tell me the future will look like this. This is the past. We have the technology of the future today, but we need to demand it. We can preserve our only home. We have no farther woods. There's no other place to go. There are seven billion reasons to join this clean revolution. I hope you all find yours. This one is mine. Thank you.